First of all, I want to say something about the modern crisis, then something about existentialism and the modern crisis, and then something about Sartre and the crisis in morality. Finally, there will be a conclusion. Now, to begin with the modern crisis, I have examined a crisis in religion and philosophy about which I want to be very brief at this time, and I still have to examine what I take to be a crisis in morality. And in all three instances, there is one common factor which consists in the enormous rise of the natural sciences and in their wake of the social sciences too. I do believe that this great development of the sciences has an enormous amount to do with what I have called the modern crisis. This does not mean to anticipate that I think that this development of the sciences is regrettable. That doesn't follow at all. I just see a connection there. Now, the way that I conceive of the modern crisis in religion, as many of you by now know, is that science has threatened traditional naive beliefs, that science has made it impossible for large masses of thoughtful, educated, intelligent people to hold the same kind of beliefs in the same way in which their parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and generations for hundreds of years have held them, and has led to a widespread abandonment of these beliefs or to an attempt at reinterpretation and in the wake of this reinterpretation, there is the very serious question in many instances, what meaning remains to these beliefs. I have further tried to point out in the first lecture that morally, this ties in with tonight's problem, that morally there has come to be a very open, a frequently, frankly avowed, process of selection where people admit that they don't accept all the moral commandments of their religion, but that they pick out some while rejecting others as, of course, primitive or, of course, to be accounted for in historical terms or perhaps in psychological terms. And in the wake of this election, the question arises whether then the morality isn't really based on reason, on experience, on conscience, and whether bringing in religion or God afterwards as a sanction is not merely redundant. There's a further problem I have suggested in the first lecture, that organized religion has always posed for true religion, a point that Kierkegaard made at particular length and with great emphasis, but a point that one could easily trace back through the history of religion at the very least, as far as the biblical prophets. And there's also an inverse proportion of the quantity of believers and the quality of believers, a point again abundantly made in the Hebrew scriptures that in times in which everybody flocks to the temple, religion is likely to become something shallow and superficial, while it is perhaps only the remnant, perhaps only the small number that has religion in a deeper sense. The crisis in philosophy, I have suggested last week, consists in the fact that emulation of the natural sciences leads more and more and more English-speaking philosophers to reject almost all, not quite all, but almost all of traditional philosophy. One begins to wonder whether traditional philosophic tenets are not perhaps just as untenable as traditional religious beliefs. Some of them seem to have to be accounted for, again, either in psychological or more often in historical terms as belonging to a certain era, but many of them no longer seem at all acceptable. 
This, I think, is a crisis, even if some people would call it by another name, the large body of philosophy that has come down to us has suddenly become questionable. People wonder whether what has been called philosophy hitherto is worth preserving. And what some of them are now doing is something quite different from what was done traditionally and, as far as English-speaking philosophers are concerned, tends on the whole to be very academic and to be of relatively little interest to the very large number, to the steadily growing number of intelligent and concerned laymen, laymen in the sense that they are not professional philosophers. There's further the factor that in philosophy too, organization plays some part, that more and more philosophers find themselves allied with universities, in fact practically all of them, there are hardly any philosophers left who do not have some university position, and being in the academies, they tend to be more academic. There's a rising number of philosophic journals which are read by fellow craftsmen, so one tends to write for each other, for other professional philosophers, for fellow technicians, instead of dealing with cosmic questions, with religious questions questions with the larger moral questions. You might say, even so, where is the crisis? And perhaps I have to add only one thing at this particular point, and that is what creates such a crisis here is that for all the emulation of the sciences so far, except possibly in such narrow fields as probability theory or something of that sort, certainly philosophers, for all their academic manners, haven't come up with any results comparable to those of the natural sciences. And where is the crisis in morality? The crisis in morality, I think, parallels the crises that I have tried to analyze in religion and in philosophy. Here, too, it is very largely due to the development of science. And again, I'm not at all critical of science for this. I don't hold it against science. On the contrary, I uh, heartily appreciate the, on the whole, anti-authoritarian attitudes that science breeds. In science, there are no authorities. In science, you can always be challenged for the evidence. You can't just say a great man said. You can't cite Newton as an authority. You have to see whether things stand up. Moreover, you have to consider alternative hypotheses. Sometimes there is a seemingly very good hypothesis, but you still have to ask, aren't there some other hypotheses that are just as good? And perhaps one of these alternatives is even more elegant than the one you already have. In this way, traditional morality is undermined. Once one gets into the habit of asking what's the evidence for what is being said and aren't there any alternatives, you have an attitude that no longer acquiesces in traditional morality. Traditional morality need not even be exactly the same for everybody. It may differ slightly in some respects depending on ethnic or on religious background. But what moralities in general have in common, traditional moralities, is that they have something authoritarian to them, that they are originally taught to a child as what's what. The parent knows, the teacher knows, the rabbi, priest, or minister knows, and the child is supposed to accept what it is told. And when one gets into the mood of saying, well, what's the evidence for this, and aren't there perhaps alternatives, traditional morality is undermined. And the obvious result that this has led to can be summed up in one word, namely relativism, moral relativism, where people ask whether whatever morality they have been brought up on isn't possibly just one morality among a large number of moralities, and is there really any reason, they ask, for preferring one to the others. The social sciences have developed further, and again they have had a 
very critical influence on morality. Here, perhaps, the best single example would be the kind of thing uh, that is exemplified by the Kinsey reports by gathering statistics, by telling people what percentage of the population does certain things. People's conscience becomes a little less stern. They have the feeling that there is some safety at any rate in numbers, that if so many people do such things, they can't be quite so bad. Of course, uh, it would be foolish to suppose that science is the only factor in this crisis in morality. It obviously isn't. There are other factors. For instance, that there are such growing numbers of people, more people than ever before. Well, with a growing number of people, there's also a growing anonymity. There's a loosening of social bonds. There's mobility. More people move around. They move from the country to a city, from a small city to a very big city, from one big city to another city. And as a result of this, there is a loosening of social bonds. Nobody knows you. The neighbors no longer know you. And here, too, certain restrictions fall by the way. And there is necessarily, as a result of this, as there always, I think, has been in history, under comparable circumstances, a growing permissiveness. And all this that I have said so far, I don't mean to take sides. I don't mean to make any particular evaluation. I just want to explain what I mean by the crisis in morality. Perhaps it is uh, relevant and even crucially important to say something about the word crisis at this point. After all, a crisis is not necessarily anything bad anyway. What crisis means, literally, is a turning point, a crucial time. The Greek word krenein means to separate, and you might say that a crisis is the time which separates the men from the boys. It is somehow a decisive moment. Krenein means not only separate, but also decide. Crisis is the moment of decision, or to use a term that is used in a certain sport, it's the moment of truth. The moment when you sort of see what stands up and what doesn't stand up. It's in that spirit that I speak of crisis, not in a nostalgic way, not by way of suggesting, aren't we an unfortunate generation, that ours is a time of crisis, but I want to leave wide open whether every time isn't possibly a time of crisis, and whether if, in some respects, our crises are more acute than ever, I want to leave open whether that is a good or a bad thing. Now, one trouble with these lectures, I think, has been that in the last lecture, although I did speak of Nietzsche, I did not, on the whole, concentrate on existentialism, but I illustrated the crisis in philosophy very largely from English-speaking philosophy. And so I, after having in these general terms characterized the modern crisis, want next to deal with existentialism and the modern crisis. And here, at least in the beginning, I can again fall back on some points previously made. I'll first deal very briefly with the two men to whom I have already devoted a lecture apiece, namely Kierkegaard and Nietzsche. One thing that they have in common, in spite of the many things that very obviously they don't have in common, is that both of them were aware of the kind of crisis that I have tried to picture for you. I don't at all go along with the attempt made by some people of kind of throwing Kierkegaard and Nietzsche together as if all their many differences were unimportant. It does seem to me that very obviously the differences are in reality more important than the things that they have in common. They're more important because they differed on the things that mattered most to them. Nothing mattered more to Kierkegaard than how one might become a true Christian, and probably few things mattered more to Nietzsche than his criticism of Christianity, not just of Christendom, but of Christianity. 
But for all that, they do have some things in common. And one thing they have in common is that in the middle of the 19th century, or one man in the middle and one man a little later, still in the 19th century, they foresaw a crisis that many people even today are not fully aware of. And one thing further that both Kierkegaard and Nietzsche recognized, and this was no mean feat in their time, was that this crisis was intimately related to the progress of science. They both recognized that. Kierkegaard drew the conclusion from this, and I dealt in detail with this in the first lecture, that science was a bad thing, that science was a dangerous thing, and that one ought to have the courage to be unscientific, that one ought to have the courage to believe what science considers absurd, that one ought to go against reason and against science. Nietzsche's attitude on the whole, I think, was in favor of science. This is one of the points on which I have tried in my work on Nietzsche to interpret him somewhat differently from the way many other people have interpreted him. I've tried to show in considerable detail that his attitude toward reason was on the whole affirmative, appreciative, and similarly also his attitude toward science. And there are abundant texts to bear this out, and in his criticism of Christianity, he comes back to this theme time and again, that Christianity has been anti-scientific, anti-rational. But although Nietzsche, in important respects, made common cause with science, he did not share as most of the thinkers of the later 19th century did, the vast optimism about science, as if now that we have science and science grows, it will solve all our problems and people will become more humane and better and everything will be fine. Nietzsche, while affirming science, realized that science did produce crises in religion, in philosophy, and in morality. Moreover, he did not agree with the English-speaking philosophers today who want to make of philosophy an academic specialty modeled on the sciences. Nietzsche did not believe in restricting philosophy to matters on which factual agreement can be obtained. In these respects, he was not at all in favor of emulating science. Here he saw some of the dangers of science. What he was in favor of, and there is a distinction worth making, and a distinction with which I definitely align myself, what he was in favor of was careful, critical thinking, and even experimental thinking to the extent of being willing to engage in thought experiments, to consider alternative views in morality, in theory of knowledge, wherever philosophers think, to weigh these against each other. There's actually one of Nietzsche's books that has the title Fröhliche Wissenschaft and subtitled Gaia Scienza, and in English should be called the Gay Science, although unfortunately it was translated, very misleadingly I think, as the Joyful Wisdom. What Nietzsche had in mind was gay science, and what he meant by science was this open-minded, critical, experimental spirit. So both Kierkegaard and Nietzsche understood the crisis, understood its connection with science, but took different views of science. Now, briefly, before I turn to Sartre, I want to go on from Kierkegaard and Nietzsche to a couple of existentialists whom I do not propose to discuss in any detail, but of whom at least I want to indicate briefly, as was suggested in the printed announcement of these lectures, how they fit into the picture, at least how I propose to fit them into this picture. There is, first of all, Martin Heidegger. The German philosopher, still living, now in his 70s, who is, by some people, considered the most profound existentialist philosopher. Now, how Heidegger reacts to the modern crisis can be, I think, not unfairly 
suggested by a sentence that I shall quote from him, and that incidentally is also quoted emphatically and apparently with approval in a recent very popular book on existentialism, where it is also singled out as very characteristic, although the author finds no fault with it. So it's not malice that dictates my picking this particular sentence. The sentence is, thinking does not begin until we learn that reason, though glorified for centuries, is the most stubborn adversary of thinking. This is what Heidegger says, thinking does not begin until we learn that reason, though glorified for centuries, is the most stubborn adversary of thinking. I think this is very interesting. In this respect, Heidegger, although widely characterized as an atheist, and he doesn't mind this characterization, he certainly is not a theist, I don't like these labels of theist and atheist particularly, but he is certainly avowedly not a theist. In this respect, Heidegger is much closer to Kierkegaard than are such people as, for example, Karl Jaspers and Paul Tillich, who make much more of their respect and admiration for Kierkegaard than Heidegger does. When Heidegger talks of Kierkegaard these days, it's by way of depreciation. He was not a philosopher, he was merely a religious thinker. Leaving out the merely, I agree that Kierkegaard was no philosopher, but a religious writer. He said so himself. But in this anti-scientific, anti-rational bias, this is interesting, I think, Heidegger, though not a Christian and not a theist, is really much closer to Kierkegaard than any number of other contemporary existentialists. Now, what remains if you have this animus against reason, if you recognize, as Heidegger too does, the connection between science and technology and the characteristic feats of the 20th century, if you recognize the connection between that, what is usually considered progress on the one hand, and the crisis in religion, philosophy, and morality on the other hand. Well, he draws the conclusion we must therefore, in some sense, oppose scientific thinking. We must oppose reason. This raises the big question, well, how then is one as a philosopher going to think and write? And what I think almost necessarily has to happen is that a philosopher who adopts this attitude must relapse into a highly arbitrary way of thinking, which will either be associative thinking, just sort of moving from one sentiment to the next one that's associated, almost the way a Freudian patient on the couch does when engaging in free association, or doing something else which really isn't so different, namely, in order to avoid total anarchy and incoherence, to find some texts of which he can then offer exegesis. And in this way, Heidegger seeks his way back to the earliest philosophers, the pre-Socratic philosophers, some of whom wrote poetically, some of whom wrote aphoristically, and all of whom have one thing in common, and that is that we don't possess any of their works, but only scattered quotations, only fragments preserved in the writings of other people. I share with Heidegger an enormously high regard for some of these fragments, which are fascinating, which are worth studying, but I don't think it is an example of sound method to try to develop a philosophy by taking sentences out of context, usually there is no context, when there is one, Heidegger still takes them out of context, and then, and it's almost inevitable, reading his own ideas into them. This is not just my opinion, but even those followers of Heidegger, who greatly admire his earlier work, if they happen to be classical philologists as well, roundly repudiate his interpretations of 
Greek philosophers as philologically untenable. And people who know their Rilke realize that his Rilke interpretations are untenable. And people who know their Nietzsche realize that his Nietzsche interpretations are untenable. But this is not surprising. This is not just something that happens to happen. But if thinking does not begin until we learn that reason, though glorified for centuries, is the most stubborn adversary of thinking, if we deliberately overrule reason and scientific procedures in the sense of regard for evidence and impartiality, well then, how can the interpretations be sound? They might in places be enormously suggestive and exciting, but I never can persuade myself that it's very difficult to be suggestive and exciting if one doesn't care to be sound. I'll give you one example, which is both in print and which I also happen to hear in person. Heidegger gave a series of lectures at Freiburg in 1955-56 uh, on what he called der Satz vom Grund, which seemed to mean the principle of reason, the principle of sufficient reason. And the turning point of the lectures was provided by a sentence which I will initially have to give in German, and I trust that some of you will understand it. He began to talk about the leap, one of Kierkegaard's conceptions, L-E-A-P, the jump, the leap. And he said, der Sprung ist der Satz vom Grundsatz vom Grund in das Sagen des Seins. Which means something like, the leap is the jump from the basic principle of reason into saying something about being. But it all depends on punning. Namely, the word Satz, he suddenly pointed out, doesn't only mean sentence or principle, but can also mean in German jump or leap, as when one says, Heidegger's own example, er ist mit einem Satz zur Tür hinaus, he is out of the door with one jump. And similarly, Grund can also mean ground, so that suddenly from the principle of reason, we get to the jump from the ground. Now, this is the height of arbitrariness. It is suggestive, but it is terribly close, and for a philosopher, compromisingly close to Finnegan's way. This makes it eminently suitable for study in graduate seminar seminars, where you want to discuss something that's difficult and puzzle it out, and something can perhaps be learned from it. But the important thing is that not only is the whole history of philosophy since the pre-Socratics rejected by Heidegger because it attempts to be rational and reasonable, but what we get instead is something that is in its nature completely arbitrary, unsound, and dangerous. That he might, for all that, have occasional insights is another matter. I personally happen to think that he has fewer of those than other existentialists. This may be a minority view, and I shall not try to argue it in detail here. I have dealt, I might say, with Heidegger in some detail, and for that matter also with Jaspers in some detail, in From Shakespeare to Existentialism, which was recently issued in paperback by Anchor Books, in chapters 15, 17, and 18. And there, too, is a chapter, it happened to be chapter 14, that deals in some detail with the relation of philosophy and poetry, which, of course, is crucial for doing justice to Heidegger, since what he wants to do is bring philosophy closer to poetry than to science. So I'll refer you here to my From Shakespeare to Existentialism and move on to a few passing remarks about Jaspers and Tillich before moving on to Sartre, with whom I want to deal in some detail. In Jaspers and also in Tillich, who are in many ways, I think, similar, you find attitudes that are avowedly and emphatically in favor of reason and in favor of science, 
They both on the whole lean over backwards, not to fear Kierkegaard's anti-scientific bias, but rather to welcome science, where religion and science conflict, Tillich is likely to say that religion must be in the wrong, and similarly Jaspers insists, being himself a doctor of medicine who specialized later in psychiatry, that it is good training for a philosopher to master one of the sciences. It's interesting, as I have already mentioned, that both of them make so much more of Kierkegaard than Heidegger, that both of them are closer to Kierkegaard's religion, though I think very far indeed from sharing it, than Heidegger, but that nevertheless, in spite of that, in basic orientation, they really have terribly little in common with Kierkegaard. And I might say that although both of them are clearly more attractive personalities than Heidegger, that both of them clearly have a kind of personal integrity that many of us feel Heidegger, if he had it, ever lost during the Nazi period, that for all that perhaps both Jaspers and Tillich are less radical for better or for worse, than Kierkegaard, and then Nietzsche, and then Heidegger, and then Sartre. They see some of the elements of the modern crisis. I am not sure that they go quite so much to the roots of it as I think Sartre does. And now, by way of making a transition to Sartre, I might say that here again I think I'm submitting to you a minority view. I think it is on the whole fashionable to say that Heidegger, particularly if one hasn't read him, is surely the profound Teutonic thinker, but Sartre is merely the journalist who popularizes all this. I don't agree with this at all. I esteem Sartre not only as a human being, but also quite emphatically as a writer and thinker much more highly than I do Heidegger. And Heide higher also than Jaspers, and so I have selected him for more detailed treatment, partly out of regard for him. I'm now ready, finally, to deal with Sartre and the crisis in morality. Very briefly, first of all, a very few data about the man. He was born in Paris in 1905 and suffered the same fate that Nietzsche suffered in one respect, he lost his father as a little boy. His father died, and then he was brought up by his mother in the maternal grandparents' house. And there's something interesting about this. His maternal grandfather is an Alsatian, or was an Alsatian, by the name of Schweitzer, and Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Schweitzer are cousins which I suppose few of you knew, and which I think is a rather piquant little detail. His mother remarried when little Jean-Paul Sartre was 11 and moved with a boy from the Alsace to La Rochelle, where he grew up. Then he absorbed his military service, studied philosophy as a philosopher, as Heidegger had done earlier. He studied for a while with Edmund Husserl, the German-Jewish founder of the School of Phenomenology, was very profoundly impressed by Husserl and started out as a philosopher with a phenomenological orientation. He did some teaching before the war, and on the eve of the First World War, in 1938, published his first novel, available in paperback, Nausea, followed it up the following year, in uh, 1939, with a collection of short stories, originally named in French Le Mur and in English The Wall, but then when it got to the paperback level, it was called Intimacy, and had... <laughs> and had a variety of rather lurid covers, 
But seeing that there are five short stories, one of which is called The Ball and one of which is called Intimacy, I must say that having read the five, I think Intimacy is the more accurate title. In this case, uh, it does not promise too much. I don't think that the stories are in any sense pornographic. I don't know that it is not misleading when the cover quotes a British magazine that said leaves Lady Chatterley sleeping at the doorpost. <laughs> but they are very frank and forthright stories which I think have points to make and which I happen to think, again a minority view perhaps, are very excellent and very profound and very interesting stories. He also published, before the war broke out, several philosophic essays, mainly phenomenological. Then he published what might be, without hesitation, called his main works during the war, chiefly Lettre Linea, Being and Nothingness, translated in full into English by Hazel Barnes, and available in one big volume and very difficult to read in large parts, as well as a play that came out the same year, The Flies, Le Mouf, and uh, about the same time another play, No Exit, and then any number of further plays, of which perhaps the single most interesting is the one, uh, Le Diable et le Bon Dieu, Lucifer and the Lord, or The Devil and the Good Lord, also published quite a bit of literary criticism. In 1946, a lecture to which I shall have to recur when I start in a moment talking about morality, which is called Existentialism is a Humanism. And then what is probably his most controversial work, a long book on a man who was, at the time that this book was written, simply considered vile and a criminal, but who is now widely considered.